Hi class! As you begin your study of ecology and environmental science, I wanted to introduce you to some concepts about environmental systems and the components that cycle through and interact within these environmental systems. Let's first look at your lesson overview. So initially, I wanted to give you some basic introduction to what are environmental systems and what are feedback loops. And then I want to spend a little more time talking about biogeochemical cycles, uh, which are basically how nutrients cycle through the environment. Now, scientists frequently like to use the word system, but what, is this, what does this term mean? A system is any group of items or of parts that are constantly interacting and are interdependent with each other. Since they are often interacting, we can consider them as a united whole. So it's a whole made up of multiple interacting parts. It can be a closed system. A closed system is, for example, could be a test tube. A test tube has multiple components with it that are interacting and reacting with each other, but nothing else is going in and nothing is going out. An open system is something like the ocean. It has multiple interacting parts, both living and non-living, but it can also interact with other systems such as the air. Now we can take our entire planet Earth and divide it into three major systems or three divisions. The first is the lithosphere, which is all the soil and rocks that you walk on. We have the atmosphere, which is the air that we breathe, and the hydrosphere, which is any form of water found on the planet. It could be solid water, ice, liquid water, or water vapor. Now we'll spend more time talking about ecosystems, which is any, an ecosystem is any environmental system within a particular area where we look at both the living and the non-living components. An ecosystem can be a pond, an ocean, a forest. And just so you have some of the vocabulary, when we talk about the components of an ecosystem, we use the term biotic to describe any living component and abiotic to describe any non-living component. So if you're talking about a pond ecosystem, biotic would be all the organisms that live within the pond, and abiotic component would be the water, the rocks, and so on. As you learn about ecosystems, one of the things to keep in mind is that often in ecos different ecosystems can interact, and the transition from one ecosystem to another is called an ecotone. And in this picture, you have an example of an ecotone, which is the transition between a forest and a grassland. And the organisms can be different in this transition area. Because within the forest, you, for example, might have a lot of shade, very little sun, and that affects what plants grow there, and the plants affect what types of animals are found in a forest. Grassland has a lot of sun, which again has an effect on the plants, and from that on the animals. And the transition area might be something in between. So it might have some of the plants and animals from both ecosystems. As you study environmental systems, one of the things you should pay attention to is what feedback loops exist within a particular system. A feedback loop is any time you have a signal that produces a response, then the, that response feeds back and influences the signal itself. You can have a negative feedback loop where, again, so you have a signal that produces a response. And when it's a negative feedback, this response turns off that initial signal. So there's a negative feedback into the original signal. A an example can be the thermostat in your house or apartment. A signal to turn on the thermostat can be lower temperature. So if it's getting cold in your house, thermostat is turned on. The response is that the room warms up. As soon as it's warm, that to higher temperature feeds back and turns off the thermostat. Um, an environmental example is um, predator-prey interactions. So say that the initial signal is that there are more rabbits being born, so the rabbit population is going up. So their predators, say wolves, have more food. That creates a response of more wolves being born. 
as soon as there are more wolves being born, they're eating more and more of the rabbits. So that negatively feeds back and decreases the rabbit population, which will then in turn decrease the wolf population. So negative feedback loops tend to be stabilizing as opposed to positive feedback, where again, you have a signal that through one or more steps produces a response. And when it's positive feedback, the response reinforces that original signal. So it's positive feedback into that initial signal, strengthening the response. In negative feedback, you had a weakening or turning off the response. Here you have a strengthening of this loop. A positive feedback loop could be soil erosion. So normally, plants, uh, trees, their roots help to hold down soil. So say that people come and cut down a forest and remove plants from a particular area. That will create a response of more soil erosion because there's no roots to hold down the soil. As the soil erodes, that means there's nutrients being removed and even fewer plants are able to grow in that and surrounding area. So that then reinforces the response in that there's more soil erosion. So you remove plants, leads to soil erosion, which causes there to be even fewer plants. And so you increase the soil erosion until you go on and on. Positive feedback loops are not stabilizing. They can sometimes be considered runaway feedback loops. Runaway feedback is that once you get into this loop, it just keeps and keeps on being strengthened. Sometimes natural events or more often human impacts can disrupt an ecosystem and the, the interactions within it. One of the examples we'll take a look at is how you get excessive growth of algae in a body of water, such as a pond. And I'll come back to it at the end of this lesson. For now, let's just think about what might have happened in this uh, pond. Do you have more of a certain nutrient? Um, well, you, how do you even find out? Well, you could measure, you could do chemical tests of different chemical components of this pond and see if anything has been disrupted. Or you could use a biological indicator to study an ecosystem and whether it has been disturbed. Uh, we use indicator species, which either through their presence or absence can signal that something is wrong in the ecosystem. These are two examples of indicator species, mayfly and trout. Both of them need high levels of oxygen to survive. So if you find them in a body of water where you'd normally expect them to live, then that indicates that the system is healthy and you have plenty of available oxygen in the water. If you take a look at an area where you would normally expect them to live, that you'd expect them to, for it to be its natural habitat, and they're not there. That can be an indicator that something is wrong in the ecosystem, that something has affected the levels of oxygen. Next, let's take a look at the biogeochemical cycles, which is the movement of nutrients through ecosystems. The first one we'll look at is the hydrologic cycle, which is the same thing as saying the water cycle. So it's the movement of water through the environment. Water exists in the atmosphere as water vapor and in, uh, on land and in bodies of water as liquid water. So how does it cycle between these two forms? Well, you get evaporation when liquid water turns into water vapor. Also, there's transpiration. Transpiration is the evaporation of water from plants. Once you have water in the atmosphere, if the temperature is cool, the water vapor can condense into liquid water droplets and clouds, and then that liquid water is eventually shed as precipitation and you get back to liquid water. Now rain can either directly fall on bodies of water like rivers, lakes, oceans, or it can fall on soil and infiltrate our, into groundwater. And groundwater is one of our sources of drinking water. Also, when it's on land, you get runoff into the oceans. This constant movement and cycling of water through ecosystems also helps to move other molecules, other nutrients through the environment. Next, next let's take a look at the carbon cycle. Carbon is present in the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. 
and how does carbon exist inside living organisms? Do you remember? Hopefully you realize that almost all of your body is made up of carbons. So all of the organic molecules in living organisms are primarily made up of carbon. Photosynthesis is the process that absorbs, that takes the carbon from carbon dioxide and turns it into organic molecules. So through photosynthesis, the carbon is incorporated into organic molecules. This is done by producers like plants and algae. Then consumers eat the producers. They're our source of carbon. Now, how does the carbon cycle back? Well, maybe you remember cellular respiration done by both producers and consumers. Don't forget that. Um, so when producers and consumers do cellular respiration, they recycle the carbon back into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Now, what about what happens to the organic molecules in organisms when they die? Well, when producers and consumers die, the organic molecules are decomposed by decomposers like bacteria. So a bacteria also absorb the organic molecules in, living, um, in dying and dead organisms. And they also do cellular respiration to turn those organic molecules back into carbon dioxide. So this is your very basic carbon cycle, but there are more parts to it. For once, say that you there's a forest fire. All of the organic molecules in the trees, in the producers, through burning in a fire, will be turned back into carbon dioxide. Another important component to remember is a long, long time ago, when organisms died and were buried, um, and when they were exposed to certain high pressure and high temperatures, all of the organic molecules in um, dead producers, dead consumers, and dead decomposers turned into fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are coal, oil, natural gas. All of, that, uh, all of the molecules in, say, the gasoline that you have in your car, gasoline is an organic molecule, and it originally came from the organic molecules in organisms that die. When you burn fossil fuels, whether you're burning the gasoline in your car or someone's burning coal, burning fossil fuels also turns the organic molecules back into carbon dioxide. That's why when you burn gasoline in your car, um, that's why part of your car exhaust is CO2. This is part of the carbon cycle. Now, humans have been burning fossil fuels at really high rates. So right now, we're actually um, returning more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than there would be present naturally. Because all that carbon that was uh, turned into fossil fuels, that happened so long ago, that at that time, that carbon was effectively removed from the atmosphere. And now, after thousands and thousands of years, we're returning that carbon from fossil fuels into back into the atmosphere. 